Welcome to Module 6, Lecture 4. This lecture is called The Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff Identity, an Exponential Entangling Relation. The Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff Identity is an old identity. It was started around the turn of the century. It's our fourth and final operator identity that we're going to be developing in the class. Of course, we might have a couple of other minor identities, but this is the fourth of the big four that we work with. On the left-hand side, you can see Baker on the top, Campbell in the middle, and Hausdorff at the bottom. This identity was derived over a period of about 45 years, starting around 1895 or so, and it was completed around 1940 by a Russian named Dinkin. It is complicated. Needless to say, anything that's going to take that long to derive is going to be a hard thing to work out. It allows the Lie algebra and Lie group theory to be well defined because what it does is it tells us that any product of two Lie group elements written as the exponentials with the Lie algebra elements or generators of the group and the exponents can be written as the exponential of something that involves those Lie algebra generators. And that is what you need to verify that anytime I multiply two group elements together, I get another group element. Now for us, we're going to find that it's a critical identity for simplifying some operator expressions. In fact, nothing else will do in the situation in the situations where we need to, when we need to use it. Uh, in particular, nothing else will do in the situations where we really need it. It is a, an entangling and disentangling identity, as you will see, we can use it in both directions. And to get us started, I want to start by talking about what happens when we have the derivative of an exponential. So, Let's first write out what an exponential that has an operator in the exponent is, and we want to take the derivative of it. So how do we proceed? What I hope I've been teaching in this class is the only thing we can do is use what we know. So how is it that we define the exponential of an operator? I hope you've remembered that we do that from the power series. So let's expand that exponential in a power series, and let's take the derivative of that power series. Because the operator doesn't depend on time, I just have to take the derivative of the times that appear in that power series. The derivative is easy to evaluate. I get an n times t to the n minus 1. Because there's an n in the numerator, there's no term when n equals 0. I then can recognize that the n can go into the n factorial and become a n minus 1 factorial, and then I'll get a t to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial. Now I redefine and let n go to n plus 1. Now my sum will go from n equals 0. I'll get a t to the n over n factorial, and I'll get an a times an a to the n. Because I had to write my a to the n as a times a to the n minus 1, and then I shifted n goes to n plus 1. Now that a, because it commutes with a to the n, can appear on either side. And then I just resum the series and get the exponential. And you see the derivative is just like the derivatives that we have with normal functions and scalar operators. And we can put that A operator on either side. Even though it's an operator, the order at which that operator appears doesn't matter. It can go on either side. Now the case when the operator depends on time is much more complicated. And we're going to carefully go through what that is in just a little bit. But we're first going to work out what is called the Weyl form of the BCH identity. And that's Hermann Weyl there on the left-hand side. He was a very important developer of Lie algebra theory and the way that you use it in quantum mechanics. And he did most of his work in the 20s and 30s that is most relevant for the group theory in quantum mechanics. And to work out the vial form, we work on a simplification of this BCH identity, which holds when the commutator for a, of A with B commutes with A and B. So that means the nested commutator of A with the commutator of A with B and the nested commutator of B with the commutator with A with B, they're both equal to zero. 
And an example of this is simply taking A equals position and B equals momentum, because then the commutator of position with momentum is IH bar. And that's a number. And of course, a number commutes with everything. So the trick to working this out is to calculate the time derivative of this operator, which is e to the a t, e to the b t, e to the minus a t minus b t. You can see that I, on the left-hand side there, I have the product of e to the a t with e to the b t. And then the term on the right-hand side looks like I've put those two operators in the exponential, but I've multiplied by with a minus sign in the exponential. So that's kind of like the inverse of e to the a t plus b t. And so when that object it has a result that's not equal to one, then this thing will give me some non-trivial result. Because if those were just numbers and not operators, the thing in the parenthesis would just equal one, and then the time derivative would be zero. Okay, now we just use our rule to calculate the derivative. We're gonna pull an A operator down when the derivative hits e to the at, we'll pull a b operator down when it hits e to the bt, and we'll pull down a minus quantity of a plus b operator when it acts on the third term. And we can put it either to the left or the right of the exponential that I'm taking the derivative of. And so for the a term, I'm gonna put it to the right of e to the at. For the b term, I'm gonna put it to the left of e to the bt. And for the minus quantity of a plus b term, I'm going to put it to the left of the e to the minus a t minus b t term. And so then that's what we get. Now our next step is to multiply by 1. I'm going to write that 1 as e to the b t times e to the minus b t. And now I'm going to recognize that I did that to create a Hadamard. So now I evaluate the Hadamard. Now e to the minus b t, b e to the b t, that just equals b because b commutes with itself. But when, that, when those two operators sandwich the A operator, I have to evaluate the Hadamard. And so I have that series that I have to evaluate. But it truncates at the first term because the commutator of B with A commutes with everything. So there is no nested double commutator there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just rearrange that and move the A to the left and change the sign of that commutator. And now I'm going to notice that both of the operator terms and both of these expressions are to the left of the e to the minus a t minus b t term and there's to the right of the e to the b t term. So I can just combine those together. And now you see the a cancels with the minus a, the b cancels with the minus b, and I'm just left with the commutator. But that commutator commutes with these operators, so I can move it to the outside. And now I have this differential equation. You see the derivative of something is equal to a number times the something. That's a first order differential equation that we know how to solve. So remember back to your physics 155 when we worked with first order differential equations. We think of that thing in the parenthesis as a function and we use the fact that at t equals zero, the function in the parenthesis is just equal to the identity operator. And then what we find is the derivative, it becomes the derivative of the logarithm of the thing in the parenthesis and that's equal to a, b, times t, I integrate that with respect to t using the fact that at t equals zero, the logarithm is equal to zero, and I get the logarithm of the expression in the parenthesis is just equal to t squared over two times the commutator a, b. The t squared over two being the integral of t between zero and t, okay? Now I just exponentiate both sides. And what we find is this expression, e to the a, t, e to the b, t, e to the minus a, t, minus b, t, is equal to e to the t squared over two times the commutator of a with b. All right, because I now multiply by e to the a t plus e to the b t from the right, but I can actually move that exponential with the commutator on either side because it commutes with everything. And indeed, I can even put it into the exponential. And so all three of these forms, e to the at, e to the bt is equal to the e to the at plus e to the bt times this correction term, e to the t squared over two commutator of a with b, that can appear to the right, it can appear to the left, or it can just add it to the commutator. In all cases, it's fine because it commutes with everything, okay? So it's a really cool identity and it allows us to do some nice simplifications of things. And you can see it also does have this quantum correction because this expression would be zero. The commutator would be zero if I was just working with numbers. So it is a quantum correction that we have here. 
Now the result is usually quoted when we take t equals one. So I'm gonna take t equals one and then we have it in this form. And this is the vile form of the BCH identity. This is the one we're gonna be using most of the time. To derive the general BCH formula, we have to first work on what's called Snedden's formula. That's a picture of Ian Snedden, who is a famous mathematician on the left-hand side. So the identity that is Snedden's formula looks pretty horrible. Okay, it says the derivative when A depends on time is an integral dy from zero to one of e to the one minus y times a of t, the derivative of a of t with respect to time, and e to the y a of t. All right, the reason why this is complicated is because in general, the operator a of t does not commute with the derivative of a with respect to t. This is often something that people have a hard time recognizing and seeing that this should be true when they first think of things. But let's take, for example, uh, operator a of t that equals x plus t times p. Okay, x being an operator and p being an operator. Now, if I take that operator and commute it with itself, of course it commutes with itself. But if I take the derivative of that operator with respect to time, I get p. And then p does not commute with x plus t tp because the commutator of x with p is non-zero and you can immediately see that that commutator is non-zero and so generically when i have an operator that depends on time it will not commute with its derivative and so that's a very important thing for you to remember when we talk about these kinds of expressions all right so how do we work this out well we know how to express the exponential in a power series that's what we used before let's use it again let's express it in the power series. And we again take the derivative of each term, but now I have to take into account the fact that the derivative of a with respect to t does not necessarily commute with a. So the first term, the a term, you know, so the one term when I take its derivative, I get zero. The a term when I take its derivative, I get a prime. The one half a squared term when I take its derivative, I, I use the chain rule, I get one half a prime a plus a a prime. And the order matters, and I can't simplify that because I don't know what the commutator of a with a prime is. And when I look at the 1 sixth a cubed term, I get three terms. I get a prime times a squared, I get a a prime a, and I get a squared times a prime. And you can figure that out by writing that a cubed is a times a times a, and then just use the chain rule evaluating the derivative on each term. And then if I have an a times an a, I can re-express that as an a squared. And that's how we got that term. Please pause the video and carefully work this out if you don't understand it. Play back the last 30 seconds and listen to what I said again to make sure that you understand how that works. If you understand that, you are really becoming a master of what is called non-commutative algebra, which is what we need to be masters of in order to do quantum mechanics. Okay, so in general, the general term, if I look at the n plus n plus first term, it's going to have n a of t's, it's going to have 1 a prime of t, and it's going to have m a of t's on the other side. And of course, n will run between 0 and n plus m. Okay? And so we have a general formula. The 1 over factorial term is going to be a 1 over n plus m plus 1 factorial because it's coming from the n plus m plus first order term. And then I have to sum n going from 0 to infinity, and I have to sum m going 0 to infinity. Again, this is a little bit subtle how this formula works out. So if you're having any trouble with this, again, pause the video, convince yourself that this works, or send me an email, or bring it up during one of our discussions, or put a post in the forum if you're having trouble understanding this. Okay, But this is what we get when we do the rewriting of the exponential as a summation and we take the derivative and we take into account the fact that the derivative of a does not commute with a all right now how do we complete the derivation of the formula we're going to take that integral and we're going to you can see that integral has two exponentials in it we're going to expand each of those exponentials in a power series and then we can do the integral term by term okay so here's how that goes so here's the expansion. I have two expansions because I have two exponentials. 
The first one is 1 minus y to the nth power times a to the n divided by n factorial. I have the derivative in the middle, and then I have y to the m, a to the m over m factorial, just like in the formula, okay? Now I'm going to bring together to the right all of the operator terms, and I'm going to move the integral all the way to the left, and I'm going to just going to collect terms, and I get an integral from 0 to 1 dy, 1 minus y to the n times y to the m. Now, you may or may not have seen this integral. It's a very famous integral. It goes by the name of a beta function. And if you go just and search Wikipedia for the beta function, you will find what this is. And when n and m are integers, this integral has a very simple form. So we're going to just plug in what that form is. It's equal to n factorial times m factorial divided by n plus m plus 1 factorial. So you see now the n factorial cancels with a 1 over n factorial m factorial with 1 over m factorial. And I'm left with this term that we had before, n plus m plus 1 factorial. And now let's look at the collection of terms that we have. Indeed, you can see that those two terms now are exactly the same. So I have shown, going from two different directions, that the derivative with respect to time of e to the at is equal to the integral from 0 to 1 dy e to the 1 minus y a of t a prime of t, or dA by dt e to the y a of t. I've shown by working out, massaging both of those formulas and meeting in the middle that those two formulas are the same thing. And so we've now established the Snedden's formula. All right, so nice check mark. That's a hard calculation. We got it to work. Now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply by e to the minus a t from the left-hand side. You see that inside that integral, there's a term that goes like e to the a of t. And I can actually take that out because a of t commutes with a of t. a of t is not being integrated over. The y is being integrated over. So I can actually factor that out, and it cancels with the e to the minus a of t. And so I have this nice expression. Now look at that integrand. I hope you can recognize what you see in that integrand. It's a Hadamard. We know how to evaluate the Hadamard. So let's evaluate it. Now you can see all of the y dependence has now been brought out into just factors in this expression that I can simply integrate. So let's integrate those, those terms, okay? Each one of those coefficients can be integrated in the sum that is the long Hadamard expression. So the integral of a 1 is going to just give me a 1. Integral of a y is going to give me a 1 half. Integral of y squared over 2 is going to give me 1 sixth. And so you can see we get this nice expression. It's an exact expression that I could even write down what the exact formula is for this if I needed to. Okay? All right, good. Now what we're going to do, because what the BCH formula is, is it says if I have e to the a times t, e to the b times t, I want to write that as e to some g of t. Now, we don't know exactly what the g of t is, but we're going to expand it in a power series in t. I'm going to write it as g1 times t plus a g2 times t squared plus a g3 times t cubed. I know that it starts with t and not with a constant because if t equals 0, the g has to equal 0. Okay? So there's no constant in that expression. It's just a definition of what the g of t is. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at e to the minus g of t times the derivative of e to the g of t. Now I can write that a second way. e to the minus g of t, if I use the definition e to the at, e to the bt, the inverse of that is e to the bt, e to the minus at. You might be surprised that the order got in exchanged there, but just multiply it by e to the at, e to the bt, and you can see that the, then you'll get an e to the bt canceling with the e to the minus bt, and then an e to the at canceling with the e to the minus at. And so indeed, that is the inverse. And then I have the derivative of those two terms. And again, what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate this two different ways. The left-hand side, we're going to evaluate with Snedden's formula. The right-hand side, we're going to just take the derivative and evaluate it. So let's do that one first. So when I take the derivative, I'm going to put the a to the right of e to the at, and I'm going to put the b to the left of e to the at. You see now the e to the minus at, e to the at cancels for both of those terms. That's gone. I'm now left with a Hadamard of an e to the a plus e to the b, 
we already worked out what the Hadamard was earlier because we have the very same thing. The Hadamard of the B term just gives me B. The Hadamard of the A term now is going to give me an infinite series when we work it out because in this case it doesn't truncate. All right? But that's an expression. It's a power series expression in T, and I can work out what every term is to every order in T. Okay? So that is one of our first results, and we're going to just keep that on the right-hand side. Now we're going to work on the left-hand side. For the left-hand side, we use Snedden's formula that we worked out. And I'm just plugging into Snedden's formula, nothing else, okay? So we get a G prime of T minus a one-half commutator of G with G prime of T plus a one-sixth G of T commutator of G of T with G prime of T and so forth. And we can work out what every single term is in that expression. It's just complicated, okay? Now we have to calculate what that derivative is. Well, G is just expressed in that power series expansion, so it's easy to take the derivative of that. And I get the derivative G of G prime of T is G of T plus 2T G2 plus 3T squared G3 and so forth. Okay? Now we just have to substitute in. So let's look at our first non-trivial term, which is G of T commutator with G prime of T. So I have to plug in G prime of T that I just wrote down there, and now I have to try to collect my terms. And I can see there's a small typo there, that G just to the, the first term in the entry to the right-hand side of the commutator is a G sub 1. Somehow the 1 got dropped. Okay, so now we work with the commutators. Remember, G1 commutes with G1, G2 commutes with G2, G3 commutes with G3, and so forth. And so we can now start collecting these in terms of a power series, collecting the powers in T. And what we find after you do this, and I do encourage you to pause the video and work this out, is we get this expression, minus one half, the commutator of T squared G2 with G1 plus T G1 commutator with two T G2 plus T cubed G3 commutator with G1 plus T G1 commutator with uh, three T squared G3 and so forth. And I'm just collecting powers of T here. I've collected through the T cubed terms, okay? Now we can simplify this because commutator of G2 with G1 is minus the commutator of G1 with G2 those both have t squared coefficients. There's going to be a cancellation, similarly with the t cubed terms. And when all the dust settles, we find that it's equal to minus one half t squared commutator of g1 with g2 plus two t cubed commutator of g1 with g3. Again, I strongly encourage you to work this out for yourself. Make sure you get the same term, you get the correct term. Okay? All right. We have another term that we have to evaluate. This one's a little bit more complicated. It's a nested commutator of g with the commutator of G with G prime. I have to then plug in what the commutator of G with G prime is and work out what these different terms are. And indeed, you get this expression. You get a 2T cubed nested commutator G1 with the commutator of G1 with G2 and a term T cubed G1 commutator of G2 with G1. I'm going to interchange the order of that inner nested commutator, G2 with G1, make it G1 with G2. There's a minus sign. I get a cancellation, and I'm let left with a net term. That's the lowest order term from this nested commutator. You can see that it's straightforward to work these out, but it gets very, very tedious. Okay, So you need to automate this in order to make it work. What Dinkin did was Dinkin found out the recursive formulas that you need to make this work. No one has written down an explicit analytic expression for what all the terms are, but we can work out, work them out if we want, depending upon how hard we want to work, to any finite order. All right, so now we put that together. We have this expression that we've worked out on the left-hand side. We get a number of different contributions of order t and t squared and t cubed. I haven't grouped them together for you, and I'm not going to actually separately rearrange this to group it together for you. But all that we do now is we equate powers of t. And so let's first look at the zeroth power of t. When I equate the zeroth power of t, I find that g1 is equal to a plus b. When I equate the first power of t, I find g2 is equal to one half the commutator of a with b. When I equate g3, I find g3 is equal to one sixth the commutator of g1 with g2 plus one sixth the nested commutator of b with the commutator of b with a. Okay. Now I'm going to have to plug in what the g1 and g2 are in that third expression to figure out what the g3 is. So we plug that in, 
And now I have to do some simplifications and there's some cancellations. And in the end, after that, all the dust settles, you get 1 12th commutator of A with the commutator of A with B plus 1 12th the commutator of B with the commutator of B with A. Again, I strongly encourage you to work out that algebra and figure out exactly what that is. All right? You can see now we have gotten the next term in the BCH series. So we're going to write that down. All right. We set t equals 1, and what we have found is e to the a, e to the b. Remember, that's equal to e to the g of t. It's equal to e to the a plus b plus 1 half commutator of a with b. Remember, that's what we got with the vial form when the commutator of a with b commuted with everything. We've now calculated the next term, a 1 12th times each of these nested commutators, and then there are more higher order terms that come in. Okay? Now, one thing that I will point out is that it is very rare that you find a situation where you truncate at that next order. Usually you only truncate at the first order for the vial formula, or it doesn't truncate, it goes on forever. But there are some situations, very rare, where you will actually get it truncating at that third term. And then of course you could use that uh, expression when that situation occurs. All right. So. This procedure, I hope you can recognize, gets very complicated very rapidly. Now let's compare this result to some other identities. What we've just worked out is the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff result. I'm not going to reread it for you, but you can see it there. Let's compare it to our exponential reordering identity when we write it in this braiding formula. So what we found there was e to the a, e to the b can be rewritten using the Hadamard identity as e to the b plus the commutator of a with b plus 1 sixth, the nest commutator of a with the commutator of a with b plus, and it is an infinite series that keeps going on unless it truncates, multiplied by e to the a on the, on the right-hand side. Now, you can see there's a lot of similarity between these formulas. I have an e to the a on the right-hand side and an e to the b. They're not in the same exponent, though. I have a commutator of A with B, but in one case it has a one half in front of it. I have a nested commutator of A with A with B. In one case it has a one sixth, in one case it has a one twelfth. In one formula there's a second triple nested or double nested commutator and so forth. So they are closely related, but they're clearly different. And indeed they really are different identities. We use them for really different purposes, but they're similar. They look kind of similar to one another. I like to think of the BCH as halfway to the exponential reordering identity. Instead of moving that e to the a all the way to the right-hand side, I put it into the common exponent with the e to the b. Okay, And indeed, if you think you can use the BCH identity again to re-express that, ex that expression on the right-hand side of the BCH identity as e to the b times e to the a times some correction, and then you will be getting towards that exponential reordering um, identity. Indeed, there is another formula that we're not really going to use, that instead of writing the BCH identity as an exponential of a sum of terms, it instead writes things as a product of different exponential terms. And that identity has a different name. It's called the Zassen House identity. And it sometimes has a usefulness, but frankly, I found BCH ends up being more useful than the Zassenhaus identity. So we're not going to be using the Zassenhaus identity as a corollary to the BCH identity, and you're not going to have to work out any formulas for that. We're really going to just stick with these fundamental four identities that we have. Okay, with that, lecture four of module six is done. We also have now completed all of our identities, all of our fundamental operator identities for the course. We're now going to be spending the rest of the course just using them. So again, you might want to re-watch this video if you need to, and certainly please pause and derive those pieces that I went through rather quickly so that you're really confident that you understand exactly how this identity works. And if you have any trouble, of course, please ask and we'll be happy to give you help.